Hello and welcome to another episode of a Brothers Creed podcast. We're talking about motivation, experiences, and exploring the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers. I'm Ethan. And I'm Jared. And today we're going to talk about something that everybody should be aware of. And this is really how to stay calm and in a crisis situation. Uh, this can be applied to so many different things, whether that's in a stressful work environment or you're in an emergency accident and you need to react. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to prepare for a situation like that, ways to cope uh, broadly and then specifically. Uh, we're going to share some, I'm going to share some examples of, from some uh, different clips of folks who have been in situations like that and what, what are things that they did uh, to remain calm or, or to keep focus on the task. So this is something that's important for everybody, especially nowadays, right? It seems like there's a catastrophe around every corner. So uh, prepare your mind and then uh, you'll be ready for anything. Yeah. All right. Let's dig into it. Let's do it. Spartans, what is your profession? Any man who must say I am the king is no true king. What I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare. If I can change, and you can change, everybody can change! Let us all unite! Let us fight for a new world! A decent world! All right. So today we're talking about weathering the storm. We're talking about the calm Finding the calm amongst the chaos. How does the saying go? Fate whispered to the warrior, a storm is coming. And the warrior whispered back, I am the storm. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Nice. So, uh, I mean, this is really, so life is all about finding the calm and the chaos. So chaos refers to, let's say, complete disorder or confusion. And calm refers to peace tranquility and serenity. So those two things are kind of polar opposites of each other. And we all live in our own chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And chaos can mean different things to different people. But uh, what we want to talk about today is how do we find that peace, tranquility, and serenity amongst our own personal chaos? Oh, for example, you know, we each have four kids. And if someone or to come into our, uh, you know, into your house with your four kids being crazy or something, or just you know, like a normal dinner, you're trying to get Jax to sit down, trying to get, you know, Colton to eat his dinner, trying to get McCoy to stop throwing his food, trying to get Weston to stop running around the room. It's like someone would be like, I can't even eat in this type of situation. And we're like, oh, this is just, yeah, this, this is, is just, this is Tuesday. Normal. This is a <laughs> Tuesday night, man. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And so, uh, you know, there's there's a couple different types of chaos that I thought about whenever we we're going through this. And one of them was kind of chaos that we just, that is kind of self-generated chaos, right? Like, to a certain extent, our family, right? I decided to have kids. And so some of that chaos is my fault. Yep. At least 50% of it's <laughs> my fault, right? And so, uh, but other times chaos is forced upon you. Yep. And that can be in different situations. And you talked about maybe a work environment. Maybe you have, uh, uh, maybe you work in a hostile work environment, or maybe you're in a restaurant and the guy sitting in the table next to you doesn't like the way your face looks, or, you know, I don't know, whatever it may be. And you're forced into a chaotic situation. Yep. And so how do you, uh, figure out the best way to handle that chaos. So one of the first things that I'm going to talk about is um, situational awareness. And so one of the best ways to prepare to uh, face chaos is being aware of your surroundings. Um, So situational awareness is being aware of what's happening around you in terms of where you are, where you are supposed to be, and whether anyone anyone or anything around you is a threat to your health or safety. Um, So there's really kind of three stages of situational awareness. One is information gathering. So it's knowing uh, the the typical sources of information available. That's like Jason Bourne when he says, 
I know that this guy over at the bar here is most likely to have a weapon in his truck, and I can run a th- three miles flat out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So the, uh, so the first one is information gathering. Second one is understanding information, being able to interpret the information that's gathered. And then third one is anticipation. And so being able to anticipate uh, how an incident would develop or how the situation is going to change. Um, so uh, a simple example that we have all done in our life is if you're driving a car, you should be aware of the other drivers. Well, first off, you should be aware of yourself, right? You should be aware of how fast you're going, what lane you're in. Um, you know, if you're turning or whatever else, the road conditions, aware of your own personal situation, but also being uh, able to be aware of the other drivers, try to anticipate their actions, such as, you know, someone slamming on the brakes in front of you or swerving into your lane. You constantly have to be vigilant and watching um, because when you're not, then that's when that's when something happens. So uh, you mentioned the, the uh, Born Identity with Jason Bourne, right? Um, that is one uh, movie that really kind of that situational awareness as a, as a kid kind of sunk into me. It's like, oh, this guy's, you know, government trained agent, all this sort of kind of he stuff. He knows what's going on yeah. around him. And there were certain things that he did, uh, just kind of a recap on the movie. He was like a, a, a military guy that got picked up by the CIA and then trained as a, uh, you know, operative and all this sort of kind of stuff. But then he gets shot and he loses all of his memories. So he doesn't know who he is. From a from a gun that's just shot. Well, he gets shot in the back, and then he dumped fa- in the ocean. Well, he falls over this boat that he was on into the ocean, and then he almost drowns, and then he gets picked up. I, don't I know. never understood why he lost his memory. Yeah, well, he got shot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that happens when it you wipes get shot. your mind when you get shot. <laughs> and so, didn't know that. And so he's like trying to figure out who he is, and but he has all these different skills and everything, and so one of the first scenes of him going back is he, he uh, goes into this bank um, that he finds, uh, he has a, an account at this ba- bank that he finds out. And so he goes in, he looks at this bank, and there's all these different passports and a you know, gun and everything and, and a bunch of money, and he's like, who am I, you know? And so people, he goes to the U.S. Embassy, and people are trying to uh, catch him, like the police are trying to catch mm-hmm. him and everybody else. And so one of the things that he does is he, um, I think he, he beats up a guy in the hallway as he's running away from everybody trying to evade. And you know how like in hotels, you're in a hotel and you turn the, you get off the elevator and there's like a little plaque on the wall that has a map of the floor yeah. and like the building and yeah. all the exits and everything. So he goes over to one of those plaques and he rips it off the wall and he's walking around with it in his hands and then he grabs the radio from the guy that he just beat up and he's listening to the radio. And it was like those two things for me was like just the 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 instinctual that was pure situational awareness for me because it's not like you know oh I'm panicking these guys are chasing me it was like I have a plan right I'm gonna formulate that plan mm-hmm. and I'm gonna proceed with it yeah. and so that was that was really cool that was a cool example and then yeah the other one it was like he's sitting in the diner with this girl and he's like you know. He goes, uh, you know, I'm always uh, facing the exits and everything. And she's like, everybody does that. And he goes, I could tell you every single license plate of the 12 cars in the parking lot. And he's like, yeah, I could tell you the who's most I could anticipate who's most likely to have a gun in their car, or this or that and everything else. And so that situation awareness, I just thought was really cool. So uh, how do we develop that skill without being trained by the government? Yeah, well, I, I think that... <clears throat> Uh, and I was thinking about this too with situational awareness. I think that that's so critical in a crowd. When you think about how a crowd reacts to certain situations, people just start running and may possibly the wrong direction or like one mantra I heard once is that the crowds are stupid, but people are smart. Yeah. So when people forget their individualness and they just follow the crowd, they are just cattle like on a stampede and so they don't. They may not know where the harm is coming from. They may run right into the person, uh, like a shooter situation. They may they may run right into that guy. Uh, and so it's important to have that individual uh, mindset and situational awareness. That like, okay, what's going on? I mean, everybody's running this way. Where did I hear the shots from? What's going on? Yeah, is this a better place to hide than running at that out there? Is there a different exit that's closer? Or 
if I'm just like, oh, everybody's running that way, maybe the exit's that way, but they're not thinking, they're just running with everybody else. Yeah. I think one way that we can prepare for that instead of being trained by the government is just to, and some of the examples that I'll give, it's just like microdose, microdose stressful situations to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like uh, put yourself in slightly uncomfortable positions so that you have to react in chaos. Uh, you know, introduce yourself to someone uh, just random in the grocery store. Yeah, or like it's called exposure therapy. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's what one of the things that uh, I'll talk about one of the examples is what they do. Yeah. Um, so, so I got a couple uh, of, of maybe hard and fast things that we can do uh, on a day-to-day basis to help us develop this skill of situational awareness. Um, so the first one is be mindful. Practice being in the moment. Whenever you are cognizant of your surroundings, you um, you, you are able to be, <clears throat> excuse me, be more fully involved in what's going on, fully engaged. You can hear, you can smell, you can see everything and react a lot quicker. Like you were saying, where did that come from? What's going on? You know, you, you can react quicker. So be mindful. Second one is uh, identify the exits anywhere you go. Um, there is always an exit and an exit doesn't typically have to, it doesn't always have to be a door it could be something else it could be a window or uh, you know something out the back of the kitchen or it could be whatever else um second or third is watch people without staring which is kind of interesting uh, i thought it said i thought it was interesting it said specifically without staring observing people around you in kind of a non-invasive way of just like you know, staring at them mm-hmm. um, and, and watching how they react, how they express themselves it gives you a, kind of a greater understanding of what's going on around you. So if you're sitting in a restaurant and, you know, you're saying, you just kind of watching, you're seeing what's going on, you, you know how many people are in there and you know, um, you know, where the exits are, you know that, you know, this guy is sitting over here and he's got four kids or there's another one, you know, a guy uh, or two two guys over there or just kind of know what's going on. Um, one thing about that is I think sometimes people, they don't quite assess a threat at like it should be. Like sometimes I, there's all these prank videos online, you know, where it's got to be in other countries because if it was in here in the United States, you'd probably get shot. You know, where people will like, be standing in the elevator like some I, I've seen several where like there's someone like standing in the elevator in like a ninja suit or something like that and they're just standing in the corner mm-hmm. and then like someone comes in they're like okay this is weird and then like push their floor and as soon as the elevator doors close the guy's like ah! you know and then people are like ah and they're trying to push the buttons to get out I'm like why would you walk in to an elevator in a closed environment with a question mark in the course saying in the court, like someone yeah. who's, you don't know what's going on. I assess, like, the, assess the threat. I'll take the next one. I'm taking the stairs today. Yeah. You know, or if I'm walking in the park and there's a, a clown with a machete, I've seen those videos too. It's yeah. like, dude, guys just walking I'm down pulling out my concealed carry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm like, nope. See, I'm walking in that direction. That's, but people will just walk right past because they think, oh, you know, it's going to be fine. It's like, yeah, you need to assess the whole situation. Yeah, I like that. Uh, look for notice nonverbal cues. So just uh, gripping, c- clenching your fists. Yep, you like can tell by, your jaw stuff like yep, that. You can tell by a lot by body language how somebody's feeling if they're nervous or angry or even if they're lying about certain things. Um, limit your distractions. This one was really interesting. So it just talks about uh, being engaged in what you're doing. Limit your extraction distractions. Um, being uh, being distracted opens you up to being more vulnerable. And there was two things that I thought specifically about this one. So one was, uh, sometimes running with headphones on. If you're like listening to loud music or something like that, you can't hear anything. You can't run behind you or a car or can't hear cars. You can't hear people behind you. I know that some, you know, some women don't like to run with headphones in because, or, you know, in a certain area or whatever, because you can't hear somebody coming up behind you. Uh, So that was one in uh, limiting your distractions. And a second one is just being buried in your phone in public. Mm -hmm. If you're going to dinner or whatever, I mean, there's a a whole other reasons why not to be uh, on your phone at all. But, uh, you know, when when you're in a public setting, 
to not just be buried in something Mm -hmm. to uh, even if, if you have to look at something, look down, look back up, look down, look back up. Don't just lose yourself in something and just completely lose what's going on. Yeah. Um, next one is, uh, trust your gut feeling and then be strategic. Uh, Trust your gut feeling. A lot of times our gut is, uh, is a great thing to rely on. Uh, if it doesn't feel right, then avoid it, right? If you don't want to get into that elevator, if it's making you all wigged out, then say, I'll take the next one or I'll take the stairs. You know, it's like follow your gut and then be strategic in what you're doing. Plan. One story about that. So one time when I was in on my mission in Mexico, we were, uh, there was most of the places I was at was just kind of like, I don't know, you could call it the hood, but it was just kind of, you know, more poor area, I guess. El you could barrio. Say. El barrio, yeah, exactly. And so we were going in, the, uh, knock, we were knocking doors just trying to talk to people about the good word, you know. And uh, we went up, to, we were we knocking this doors in this one kind of apartment complex. And uh, there was these, like, these guys were kind of these gangster guys. And they were walking around and, and, uh, we were I was we had knocked the first floor. There's only three floors, three or four floors, and I think we were knocking the second floor, and we could. It was only one door. Then I like right next to me, I could I could look up and I could see the next story, the next door uh, that was the next one up, and uh, we were just kind of waiting for someone to come to the door. And this guy pulls out a pistol and he's aiming it and you know kind of playing with his gun, and I was like, dude we're done here. And we just walked away. I was like, I'm not going, we're not knocking the rest of this building. We're done. We're walking away, you know? And, uh, yeah, I was kind of like, uh, yeah, I don't know if that was situational awareness. It's just like a no brainer. <laughs> <like>, no, <Nope. laughs> it was a pretty blatant situation, <laughs> but no, I think it definitely takes, you know, some people would have been like, Oh, you know, that guy, that guy needs to be rescued. You know, and I was like, I'm not going to die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's just something that, I think situational awareness is really important in uh, s- certain chaotic s- moments, mm-hmm. right? But also it's important to be situationally aware in your life and, you know, your career and what you're doing and how you interact with your kids and, um, you know, how you comport yourself in public and everything else. Yeah, we talked about being self-aware. We did an episode on self-awareness, yeah. which is uh, a little bit different than like than situational, situational but, awareness. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that, you know, talking in, in regards to dealing with a crisis or preparing for a crisis, uh, I had a couple of, uh, of notes that I took. First of all, was just embrace uncertainty. And that's why I talked about microdosing or exposure therapy. If you embrace that there's uh, always going to be change and uncertainty, then it's nothing that when it happens, it's not crazy to you. you know, expect things to be changing. Uh, the next one is you should plan for a crisis. So in a broader sense, you know, have like, let's say a house fire, uh, you should plan for that. What are you going to do? You know, we had Toby Gagnon on, he talked about kind of home preparedness type stuff, uh, where you have a fire plan, you know, have fire escapes or ladders for certain windows, have a plan with your family, stuff like that. Uh, that's always good. Uh, but also it's important to identify the risks. Like you talked about in a restaurant, who's a risky, if I'm sitting next to this guy on a bus and his eyes are rolling back in his head and he's gripping his arm, maybe this guy is you know, shooting up drugs or something. Who knows what this guy's on? cracked out. Maybe I should go sit somewhere else, you know? And, uh, there's a, a way. So like, so I think if you think about it from like a business perspective, if there's a crisis that happens, the first thing you should be think you should have a plan. How do I get back to business as usual? And then how do we get back to, um, uh, you know, full operation? So, yeah, like, there's a there was a time in our family when uh, we had to, uh, our, our second oldest was not sleeping at all. He would just cry all night long. And I was working at Goldman at the time, and, you know, the hours are so easy. <laughs> yeah. no, and it was, it was long hours. Uh, Shannon was, uh, my wife was having, you know, postpartum depression. She, well, I don't know if it was diagnosed, but she was just like really depressed, especially because we weren't getting any sleep. I mean, every single hour we were with him trying to work his legs and trying to get him to stop talking, stop crying and stuff. Uh, and then I was like, okay, this is a declared a family emergency, state of emergency. You know, like 
<laughs> we were requesting federal funds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so it's just like, okay, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to get him to stop so that we can sleep and like get back on track? And I think it really, the issue was that he wasn't getting enough food. Uh, and we didn't know that because there's not like a gauge on a breast. Mm-hmm. You can say, Oh, he's received four ounces this evening. So, uh, but we didn't know that. And the pediatrician honestly wasn't any help either. So, we were new parents too, so a lot of factors went into it. But you know, understanding, hey, this is what we need to get to. Let's employ everything that we can to get to this point. Uh, that was a crisis for <laughs> for our small family. Uh, effective communication. So a bad situation can get worse when clear communication is not established. Uh, you know, rumors or speculation can fill the void when good communication is absent. Imagine firefighters fighting you know, wildfires in the, in the mountains, if they don't, have, if they don't communicate, this thing is just, it, it, it's getting even worse. Uh, so look after yourself and your own, and your own security. You can't help anybody if you yourself become a victim or you're putting yourself in danger. That was one of the things when I was a lifeguard. Uh, one of the things that actually I did a lifeguarding class in high school and I'm going to toot my own horn here. Uh, whole class of people, uh, we took the lifeguarding test, uh, and I was the only one to pass the test. Really? Yeah. I took that same class. Yeah? yeah I'm sure you passed the I test. I passed it. Yeah. So it, I think that one of the things that people didn't realize is that if and it, it always asks you, what do you do in this situation? You know, someone's in the open water. Uh, what do you do? And they're just like, we'll run in and save them, of course. It's like, well, no, you have to evaluate the situation, make sure it's safe for you to do so. Uh, make sure that uh, you know someone now like you know help us called. And it's like these different steps. That's the emergency preparedness merit badge exactly, coming in. Exactly, man. I was like, dude, I got the uh, like what, what's the first the, aid, first aid. emergency preparedness. There was a water one too that was like lifeguarding. Yeah, uh, I think it was called life saving. Uh, anyway, I was like, dude, I already got that merit badge, man. Easy. And so, like one of the things that a lot of the kids missed was like you need to be safe yourself. If it's dangerous, don't go in. And like when in lifeguarding classes, they'll teach you how to like headbutt someone in the face or elbow them in the neck or, or get out of a situation where they're dragging you down because they're panicking. Yeah, they're panicking and they're dragging you down. So it's like or you go come up behind them and you pinch the under their arm to chill them out to like to, hey, I'm here to save you and I don't want to die, too. And so that's one of the things that uh, is important, too. Uh, the last one is kind of if you're on a team of folks, you know, like in a, in a marriage or on a, in a work team or on a firefighter team or something like that, building trust and loyalty with your teams will help you weather that crisis. Uh, and uh, as you lean on each other, I mean, especially you know, talking about a platoon or yeah. something in the military. Uh, so when that's kind of preparing for the crisis, if you are prepared, you shall not fear. But when you're in the crisis, what do you do then? So there's a couple different things. You can manage your feelings uh, when you're in a crisis, your feelings are going to be all over the place. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, what am I, this so much is happening and you're feeling so much and those feelings are only going to act to distract you. Uh, I have a little clip here that I want to share uh, from uh, one of our favorite, or at least one of my favorite yeah. t- TV yeah, shows I called agree. Lost. Uh, and it's one of the scenes uh, where there's a guy, he's a, he's a surgeon and he's got this this girl, the, the plane has just crashed and he's got a big cut on his back and he asked this this other girl. He says, "Hey, can you help sew up my back?" And she's everybody's like, kind of in shock. Yeah, and she's like, "I don't know if I can do that. You know, I've only ever sewn drapes." And he's like, "Well, you can do it. Just just come do it." And then he starts to tell her a story about when when he was a surgeon, something that happened. Uh, and and it goes back to that thing, like coping with a crisis, managing your feelings. So let's listen to that. I might throw up on you. You're doing fine. You don't seem afraid at all. I don't understand that. Well, fear is sort of an odd thing. When I was in residency, my first solo procedure was a spinal surgery on a 16-year-old kid, a girl. And at the end, after 13 hours, I was closing her up and I I accidentally ripped her dural sac. It's right at the base of the spine where all the nerves come together. Membrane is thin as tissue. And so it, it ripped open. 
and the nerves just spilled out of her like angel hair pasta. Spinal fluid flowing out of her. And I... And the terror was just so crazy. So real. And I knew I had to deal with it. So I just made a choice. I'd let the fear in, let it take over, let it do its thing, but only for five seconds. That's all I was going to give it. So I started to count. One, two, three, four, five. And it was gone. I went back to work, sewed her up, and she was fine. If that had been me, I think I would have run for the door. No, I don't think that's true. You're not running now. So that that scene, you know, he kind of explains that crazy situation where he cuts that girl's uh, dural sack and everything goes flowing everywhere and he's just like, oh my gosh, and just terror takes over. And then he talks about how he managed his emotions to really... Uh, get through that crisis. He allowed the fear to come in, and then he got through that crisis. And uh, obviously, it's a movie, but I still think it's it's an important lesson on on how to. Uh, if you're just wildly out of control, you can't do anything. Uh, so the next thing about coping with a crisis is to put plans into practice. Uh, so follow the plan that you have. Uh, a lot of times, now I'm not a military man, but I do know that a lot of times with the when a military operation occurs. Uh, they have so many a plan A B C D you know oftentimes multi- contingencies multiple yeah. contingencies multiple exits multiple exit sites or or um, areas that you can go to to be lifted out and so uh, the plan has built into it uh, so many contingencies and and fallbacks and different plans was like Mike Tyson said so everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually from a, a different quote that said everybody has a plan until the first shot is fired. Uh, yeah. I think that was uh, some general that said that. But that's uh, interesting. You know, with anything, uh, just follow the plan that you've set before, and that's where uh, preparation comes in. So support others who are also in a crisis. Uh, you could see that in that clip he was supporting that other girl who was also in the crisis uh, to get through that and give her confidence. He says, well, she says, well, I think I would have ran for the door. He said, well, you didn't. I don't think so because you're here. Yeah. Sewing me up. Uh, so guard against, this is an interesting one, guard against negative behaviors that can make the situation worse. So uh, abandoning the team to cover yourself or clamming up and forgetting the principles of effective communication, blaming others, uh, forgetting procedures or processes in a state of panic. I mean, I'm sure you, we've seen different movies and stuff where there's some guy that's like, oh, I just can't do it, you know, and he's and he's panicking and they're like, dude, just calm down. And he stands up and he gets shot in the head or something like that, you know? Yeah. And so, or or he just is like, oh, just he just runs away and then it just ruins everything. And so uh, you got to stay. Yeah. Also, negative talk can also mm-hmm. spiral things out of control. You know? Yeah, or yeah, or people just in general, people in a crisis, whatever that crisis might be, some people just get completely hysterical, oh, and yeah. it's just like unconsolable. Like they just completely lose their mind. Yeah, and um, like I, I, I had, like, I was gonna go say, ahead. like if you're stranded on a boat, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, some guy stands up, he's like, "We're all gonna die out here. This is crazy. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna drown." It's like, yeah. dude, calm down. You're winding everybody up, and that's not gonna help the situation. Yeah. Well, it's like on on the Titanic. You know, they had people that were uh, they were trying to. The whole thing was a complete mess anyway, but they were trying to load people into the boats and and, uh, uh, lower the boats down. But then you had other people that were just like completely losing their mind and and they put like 10 times the amount of people that were supposed to be in the boats on the boats as they were lowering them down. And then they'd get so heavy that they would like the ropes would snap and then they would fall in the water and kill all the people. Um, Well, well, that's why they also had the... I thought... 
Well, I thought for the most part that they actually underloaded most of those boats. At the beginning, they did. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning, they were like, oh, just put just the number of seats. Women and children. Yeah, yeah. women and children, just in the number of seats. But towards the end, they were just trying to cut the ropes to get them off, and it was a mess. Well, that's why they had the orchestra playing. Yeah. To calm people's emotions in a time of crisis, because people were literally freaking out. Yeah. So I had, uh, and this probably is a topic that could use a whole episode, but... um, it's the the topic of uh, millennial manliness. Whenever he was on the podcast with us, he talked about this. And it's the difference between reacting and responding. So responding to a situation versus reacting. So uh, reacting, for instance, is like uh, when something happens, right? You hit me, I'm going to hit you. You cheated, now I'm going to cheat. You annoyed me, so I'm going to get my revenge and I'm going to be annoying. You yelled at me, so I'm going to yell back. It's just it, it's it's a quick reaction that almost happens instinctually. Um, uh, reactions are done on on impulse, with really without putting together any thought or consideration of what what might come next. Yeah. Um, whereas compared to uh, responding to a situation, uh, responding to a situation is. Uh, more uh, a more thoughtful uh, outcome. It is uh, done with with reasoning. People who respond put their thoughts ahead of their actions. Uh, they process, or at least they try to process before they act. Um, they try to formulate some sort of intelligent intelligent response to whatever stimulus or whatever situation that they're in. Um, so this would be uh, more of an example of your. Let's say you're at a, a crowded uh, concert or a sporting event, and someone bumps into you. Um, but you know, before they they say they're sorry, and they turn around and and they push you, and you could react or respond in that situation. You could you know push them back, and hey, you know, then it's going to cause some kind of big issue, or you know, you could step back, say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, or you know, if it if it de-escalate the situation, I think a lot of that responding is helping to de-escalate the situation, right? If my five-year-old, um, you know, drops a plate in the kitchen when he's unloading the dishwasher and it breaks everywhere and I just, you know, fly off the handle and, and yell at him, what are you doing? Why did you do that? Blah, blah, blah. Then it, it, it's going to, that's just a complete reaction on my, on my, on my part. But if I were to take a second... And say, just think to myself, okay, that plate we got at Ikea for one dollar, it's probably not that big a deal, mm-hmm. right? And uh, there's glass everywhere, and he's barefoot, and so you, you got to just process everything quickly, and then you can respond. You can say, okay, bud, you know, just stay there, it's fine, it's not a big deal, you know. He would cry anyway if that happened, just because <laughs> he would probably think that I was gonna yell at him, yeah. but uh, so. Uh, kind of rounding out the respond versus react thing is that um, if you look at the process, reaction is panic and proceed. Panic and then proceed. Panic and proceed. Right? But responding is pausing, processing, planning, and then proceeding. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more methodical and it's not um, just off the handle. And I think you can create in your mind if you constantly think that it is if if you are if you are used to reacting in every situation then that's it's going to be hard to switch that mentality Mm -hmm. but if you switch your mentality to more of a methodical thinking in processing then it'll probably take time and i'm just trying to work on it myself but it'll take time to that will become your new norm Mm -hmm. and whenever you are faced with the situation you will respond to it rather than react react to it and you'll yeah. be able to process what's going on and then act. Yeah, I think that for the, I think that in many scenarios that's absolutely that's absolutely true. I think that there are some scenarios in which reaction is the only thing you can do. Uh, for example, like a police officer or a military, they are they train with their guns, reload the mags, train lo- locked, you know, um, just load the gun and. All, they do that over and over and over again. Rack the slide, holster the weapon, all this stuff, so that they so that that is second nature. 
So they've done it so many times. They practice so many times that when they are in a gun a gunfight, they just they just react. They don't have to think about anything. They just know, boom, mag out, mag in, slide, pull out, shoot. Uh, and in that situation, their training has made their reaction the appropriate response. Yeah, I, th- I think maybe they they created the process and the plan exactly before they got to the situation. Yep. So it's kind of like, yeah, they pre-planned yep. and they pre-responded so that whenever they that reaction is needed, yeah, they don't have to. They don't have to think about it. They don't yeah. have to do anything. I mean, know? they still have to, you know, they still have to respond, right? They still have to consider if they're shooting at somebody, they'll still have to consider what's behind yeah, that person yeah, yeah. and stuff to whatever else. But yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think like training yourself, uh, you know, in, very few of us are going to be in that type of situation. Most of us are going to be in situations where we have at least a second or two or, 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 you know, or to think, what's going on here? What am I, what's going on? But there are certain situations, I think, where you have to be able to respond without even thinking. And uh, you have to hopefully have been trained for that moment so that you can respond accordingly and not just like haphazardly. Yeah. And that's what you're saying, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. Uh, one of the cool things that I was looking at is I looked at the, some of the most stressful jobs. Uh, interesting. Oh, interesting. And okay. they, they talked about there's a, like a stress index uh, that they've calculated based off of like hazardous and like time crunch, these different things. Uh, the top 10, I'll just name a couple here. Uh, first one is enlisted military personnel. That's number one. Uh, next is a firefighter, then airline pilot, then police officer. Then broadcaster Ron Burgundy. Yeah, I'm Ron Burgundy. Well, yeah. <laughs> then podcaster. Who put that question mark there. <laughs> yeah, podcaster. Then podcaster. <laughs> no, that's event coordinator. And I actually think that that one's true. Event coordinator. I have been an event coordinator before, and it is very stressful. Yeah. Uh, when I was in college, I did. We did me and this other guy did a company called the Double Check Productions, uh, and we put on this big concert uh, at the uh, at the Rexburg Fairgrounds, and I was in charge of like making sure it was all went smoothly, uh, and it was very stressful. I was the MC for the whole thing. Oh yeah, and I was like, Ugh. that's stressful. So news re- next was news reporter, public relations executive, uh, senior corporate executive, and then taxi driver. I don't know, maybe if you're like, especially maybe especially a new taxi big, driver if you don't big big know the area as much or if you. I don't think anymore because it's just like you just plug in Google. Google. Dude, it's an Uber, like Uber driver. Oh, I think Uber driver and taxi driver is a little bit different because you just flag down a taxi driver and you're like, take me here. And they have to know exactly where here is the best way to get there, the best. Yeah, I think there's more of a... But anyway, one of the things that I wanted to focus on this enlisted military personnel. So one of the things I've always been fascinated about is the medics, the military medics. I went on the uh, army.com website and was reading about the military uh, school and how they test and train their medics. And I want to read a little bit of that. It says the school has two blood labs uh, in which the students sharpen their skills as soldier medics. One lab simulates the scene of a suicide bombing in a marketplace and the other simulates a bombing in an office building. Strobe lights cut the darkness and fog machines fill the room and obscure the setting. Bloody mannequins, some with in uniform and others dressed as civilians, are scattered on the floor in a maze of rooms. Blaring music and screams of pain and panic fill the air, and the medics must work through the scenarios using both their soldiering skills and their medical training. In their attempts to render aid, they must first look for homemade bombs and enemies bearing weapons. That's what I've talked about earlier. Evaluate the situation. If you're not safe, uh, it's not going to be good. Uh, this is somewhat of a paradigm shift for the for use of medics, who in past wars often put themselves in harm's way to render aid and rarely used weapons in battle. Q, uh, was it Hacksaw Ridge? Yeah, I was just about to say that. Uh, he also continued, says, now they are told to shoot first, eliminate the enemy, and then go about their tasks as a medic. And I like this last piece he said, be soldiers first, don't become part of the problem, become part of the solution. Uh uh, so I, I think that that is, uh, interesting also how they had that exposure therapy with, you know, lights and fog, and loud camera, music and, and to look around lights. and evaluate the situation. Uh, that's that exposure therapy that, you know, you can do to train 
how you would react in that scenario. Practice like you play, right? That's what they always say. Yeah. Um, I had one other thing here that was an example that I just admired so much uh, of, and that's the the cave, the British cave divers who rescued those 12 boys out of the Thailand cave. Uh, that had flooded. Yeah, there was flooded. So there's a soccer team of 12 Thailand boys, and they went on like a cave caving expedition right before the monsoon season, and they got trapped back in this cave like two and a half miles back. And so it was like this worldwide thing, and uh, they brought in like the best cave divers from all around the world, and these guys would, they went back and eventually found these kids, uh, and I think it was 18 days they were in this cave. And the kids were huddled in way back, back, back corner, and they were like, okay, so they they were like, how do we get these kids out of here? And they had tried to, um, one of the Thai soldiers, they had tried to uh, kind of, get him out like he was kind of strapped to the chest of one of the uh, expert cave divers and the guy would freak out and flail his arms and he would you know it just was a disaster uh, i think one of them actually one, one of them died yeah uh, because of that and so they're like we can't barely get these guys. that was an adult that was an adult so imagine having a kid this was this was out. yeah underwater they had a mask on the person and they were just supposed to be calm while the diver take took yeah. them through so what they did is they ended up sedating the kids. They put a full face mask on the kids, uh, and then they would take the kids out. Now, this is pitch black. Oftentimes, the water is rushing, running water, and they had a line, like a rope, that was going through, uh, and they had all these divers in here to take these kids out. So imagine you've got this kid strapped to your chest. He's passed out. You have to stop every now and then to make sure he's actually even breathing and alive. I think you were like 13... 12, 13, yeah. 14 years old. Uh, oh, you're saying the number of kids? No, 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 oh, the, the age. The age yeah. yeah. And so they were, uh, one of the things that this one guy says, it, it's just absolutely crazy, one of the things that, uh, the situations he got in. And I'll play a little bit of a clip here, and then I'll, I'll give a little bit more uh, explanation. This was an interview that was with him, uh, Channel 5 News. And uh, it was interesting what he said about uh, the situation that he got himself into. So I'm going to play this here. Uh, so you were in the pitch black, holding... Holding one of the boys. Not knowing where you were going. Yeah. So at this point, I, I hadn't moved, and I knew the dive line couldn't be far away, but I couldn't find it. What was going through your head? So I deliberately tried to slow my breathing down, tried to stay exactly where I was, stay stationary, um, deploying a strategy of looking for the line, um, and then ultimately finding this electrical cable. So was it a relief at that point? Once I realised where I was, it was a relief. Obviously, I still had one of the children with me. We still needed to get him out to safety. Um, hypothermia is a, a concern when you've got uh, young children in the water for that length of time. So um, I tried to, I wrapped him up in a space blanket that, that we had uh, whilst I waited for one of my diving colleagues to come past. Because it does sound like a script out of a Hollywood movie. So one of the interesting things is that this guy's going along and he said that and this is in the movie on Netflix and he says that he was holding the, the line and all of a sudden the line just went ping and it just shot away from him somewhere and he couldn't see anything and so he's like oh no and that was like his guideline yeah, to get out to get out and there's so many different passages and there's there's zero visibility in this water and so he's he's just like he said he's free he's like oh my gosh he's trying to stay calm manages emotions and he's fe applying these different tactics to feel the wall around uh, to, to find that line, he says he ends up finding a, some kind of line, an electric cable, and he kind of follows it a little ways, and then he comes up uh, on, on like a little beach inside this little cave because uh, there were several little beaches inside the cave or just little pockets, like of, pockets air, of air, air yeah. you could say. And so he gets up on there, and he's like, I don't know where I am. He, he's like, I have no idea where where I am even at. He's like, I don't know what chamber this is. Did I take a wrong route or something, and he said that another diver came through, uh, and he was like, hey, 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 and the guy's like, he's like, where am I? And he's like, oh, you actually went back. He went back into the cave. Oh, so really? He, he actually swam backwards to a prior chamber that he had been in, and he was like, oh, so I was going the wrong way. And he was like, yeah. And so that really rattled him. He said, like he said, he, for four minutes, he didn't know where the line was. 
And so he got turned around. He went the wrong way. And it's a good thing that other diver came by because he was like, oh, my gosh, I could have just kept. If he would have kept going the wrong way, he would have been dead, run out of air. Yeah. Or run out of chemicals. with for Sedation chemicals for the kids. The I, kids would have. I wonder how long it took them to swim the two and a half miles out of the cave. Uh, hours. Yeah. Uh, it took them hours. And, you know, just to hear these guys like, oh, my gosh, you know, the amount of stress that I was under is unbelievable. And coming up that out of that, through that last little bit of the cave where, where they, coming out basically mm-hmm. with the kids uh, at the point of the cave where everybody could get to. Uh, he's like, it was just like the most relieving thing in my entire life. Wow. It's just so much stress. And to do that underwater, under pressure with some child on your chest, can you imagine the, the amount of pressure that you would have to Yeah. Do? So it, it's interesting because in, in a couple of these different things we've talked about, um, and even that one right there, I kind of looked up some some topics or some tips on how to stay calm in, in life and even in certain situations. But the number one thing was uh, breathe. And that's what that guy said. He said, I just, I, I tried to calm my mind. I tried to calm my body and I tried to control my breathing. Cause when you get stressed out, you get scared and your heart rate goes up and you start breathing and hyperventilating and panicking. And it just, it ensues into more and more and more and more. So if you can control your breathing and just slow it down, take some deep breaths and it'll help you to focus, uh, count to 10. It's like the other one, the guy, you know, let the fear in for five seconds. And then after that, it's gone. Um, you know, just kind of uh, taking a walk or moving yourself from the situation if possible, right? If my kids are completely driving me absolutely insane in the chaos, then go outside in the quiet for five minutes or walk around the block for a second and then come back and, and, and refocus, recenter. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, take some time to meditate. It's very similar to that. Uh, practice gratitude is another thing that whenever you're feeling down or depressed or stressed or whatever else, thinking about uh, good things in your life and positivity, gratitude, that can make you feel better and yeah. calm you down. Yeah. One of the ones I had read was like, think about your past successes. So in a crisis, you could be like, oh, I can't handle this. Mm-hmm. But if you remind yourself of your past successes and your abilities, and you say, well, I, I'm confident that I can actually get through this. And that will help your confidence in a crisis. Yeah. I, I, I love that. And another one was get moving. Uh, exercise can be like a huge stress reliever. Um, and even in certain situations, like if you were in a crisis situation, w- what if you, uh, you know, were uh, three miles down an abandoned road, your cell phone didn't work and somebody got hurt and the only way you could sit there and tr- just wait along the side of, you know, wherever you are, or you could run three miles, right? Are you physically fit enough to react to a situation. Um, and so uh, yeah. let things roll off your back and then uh, get help. If you're having trouble, uh, enlist other people or support you and help you through through uh, whatever you're doing. Have a team. Yeah. If you don't have a team, find somebody that you can, that you can trust or someone that you can go to, even if it's just like a, a, a clergy member or a, a pastor or something like that, someone that you can trust and, and ask for some guidance if you don't have friends or family that your brothers in the creed that's right your brothers within the creed you you should have someone that you could lean on or or go to and just say hey man i'm feeling this way what do you like how can i how do you think or i'm having a crisis here you know is there what do you think i should do or i need help you know yeah it's okay to ask for help definitely so uh, there's a lot in this episode obviously we could there's anything from you know (laughs) We've got a whole spectrum, you know, crisis in life versus a, a crisis pulling kids out of a cave. Uh, so, so, so many different things here, but I think it's a great lesson about how to cope uh, in those types of situations, how to prepare for those types of situations. Yeah, I think we started off as like if you, the, the quote, if, if you are prepared, you shall not fear. Uh, another one that I, another quote that I love is information is power. The more you know, the more powerful and the more confident you can be in a situation. Um, and then, you know, what, know what type of situation you're putting yourself into. If you need to, to, you know, if you're going to go buy a washing machine off Craigslist, but it's in like the freaking middle of 
I don't want to say the hood, but right, so <laughs> if if it's in the a, bad part, a, a of bad town. part of town, right? Probably don't go pick it up at eleven <laughs> o'clock at night. Yeah, right. Maybe go do it at one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Yeah. Don't put yourself in situations that you might have to react to. Yeah. Um. So I think all these different things we can do. Um. You know, practice makes perfect. Put yourself out there. Put yourself in situations that that stress your body and your mind a little bit, and uh, test yourself. That's right. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. I uh, appreciate you listening to the episode. Uh, that's it for today. Let's build that crew together. All right. Let's do it.